Okay, good morning, everyone. So, in this uh, extraordinary lecture series where we are getting a lot of information and knowledge, uh, we have today a team from KMC Manipal and they are going to speak on a very important topic on drug interaction. And what I want to do in this that I would like to request Naveen to introduce a speakers, a speaker and moderator both. And please write down your question answer in the chat box. We will take it at the end. So, Naveen, are you there? Yes, madam. Yes, please. Introduce Kritika and Gayatri, please. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, the moderator for today's session is uh, Dr. Kritika Rao. Dr. Kritika Rao uh, is the assistant professor in the Department of Palliative Medicine and Supportive Care at uh, KMC Manipal. She has done her MD palliative medicine uh, from Tata Memorial. Subsequently, uh, completed her SR ship at Tata Memorial and joined Manipal. She is the pediatric uh, palliative care lead uh, for our department. And uh, today's uh, session is presented by Dr. Gayatri Sitaram, uh, who is the first year resident. So uh, on to them, uh, that's a very brief introduction. So they will start the session. Thank you. Dr. Kritika. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for having us here. And with today's session, we will be discussing about uh, the, drug, uh, the various uh, palliative care drug interactions. And we have Dr. Gayatri presenting on it. Gayatri, can you please share your presentation and start with it? Good morning, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, today, I'll be discussing the drug interactions that we commonly encounter in palliative care setting. Uh, drug interactions will be broadly discussed under pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic, and pharmaceutical drug interactions. For an overarching understanding of drug-drug interactions, I would highly recommend reading this review article by Stephen A. Bernard and Edward Bruero. Uh, wherein they explore the various types of drug interactions and underlying mechanisms. They broadly divide mechanisms of drug interactions into pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic interactions. Pharmacokinetic occur when a drug alters the disposition, that is absorption, distribution, and elimination of a co-administered drug. It can be further divided into interactions that affect the absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, and transport. Pharmacodynamic interactions occur when pharmacological effect of one drug is altered by that of another drug in a combination regime. Another variant, another type of mechanism of drug interaction would be pharmaceutical, also known as incompatibility, which is a physiochemical interaction that occurs when drugs are mixed in IV infusions, causing precipitation or inactivation of active principles. For example, ampicillin, chlorpromazine, and barbage rates interact with dextrins in solution and are broken down or form chemical compounds. Coming on to pharmacokinetic drug interactions. Drug-drug interactions are one of the most commonest cause of medication error in developed countries, particularly in the elderly, due to polytherapy with a prevalence of about 20 to 40%. This review article by Valeria Catrino describes the mechanisms of pharmacokinetic drug interactions, focusing the interest on clinical implications. Firstly, let's look at the potential mechanisms of drug interactions involving adsorption and distribution. Altered gastric pH. The basic principle involved here is for a drug to be uh, absorbed, it has to be lipid soluble. And for the drug to be lipid soluble, it has to be a non-ionized molecule. So the weakly acidic drug in a uh, acidic medium becomes non-ionized and hence it is better so uh, uh, lipid soluble and better absorbed. Elevation of gastric pH by administration of antacids increases the solubility and absorption of such sparingly water-soluble agents such as aspirin and sulfonamides. 
chelation of compounds, for example, tetracyclines and ciprofloxacin can form insoluble chelates with calcium, aluminum, and iron, resulting in, in its reduced antibacterial effect. This interaction can, however, be avoided if interval between the medications is at least two to three hours. Chelation also seems to play an important role in, redu uh, in reducing the bioavailability of penicillamine caused by antacids. Adsorption of compounds. For example, activated charcoal can absorb acetaminophen and prevent its GI absorption during an overdose. Altered gastric emptying and intestinal motility. For example, uh, metoclopramide can cause uh, rapid gastric emptying and thereby increase the rate of intestinal absorption of concurrent drugs. On the contrary, anticholinergic drugs cause delayed gastric emptying and therefore reduce the rate of absorption. Altered intestinal blood flow, uh, act, uh, altered active and passive intestinal transport, altered intestinal cytochrome P450 isoenzyme activity has also contributed in uh, uh, affecting the drug uh, absorption. Altered intestinal P glycoprotein. P glycoprotein is an ATP dependent efflux pump. It, may, uh, it is known as housekeeping protein that determines the uptake and efflux of drugs. Opioids such as morphine, fentanyl, and methadone, commonly used in palliative care settings, are potent inhibitors of P glycoprotein that, pre uh, uh, that prevent P glycoprotein mediated drug efflux and thereby increase the toxicity of their substrates such as digoxin, antibiotics such as erythromycin. Factors affecting distribution mainly are altered protein binding. For example, sulfonamides displace the binding of tolbutamide to its binding protein and hence increases the hypoglycemic effect. Drug interactions affecting the metabolism. Here mainly we'll look at cytochrome P450 and its role. Inhibitors and inducers are called as precipitant drugs and substrate drugs whose metabolism is altered are called as recipients. Lipid-soluble agents are first metabolized by two reactions termed phase 1 and phase 2 before being eliminated. The phase 1 enzymes most frequently involved are cytochrome CYP3A4, 3A5, CYP2D6, CYP2C6, and CYP2C19. CYP3A4 accounts for 30% of the hepatic cytochrome and isoenzyme content and is responsible for metabolizing 50% of the medications. CYP3A4 gene is found on chromosome 7Q at the short arm of 21-22 locus and has two 5' promoter sites that allow for increased enzyme expression through induction. Here we should know the genetic polymorphism in CYP uh, in cytochrome uh, P450. About 75% of all drugs are metabolized partly or completely by cytochrome P450. The most important enzyme here is CYP3A4 followed by CYP2D6. Around 20 to 25 percent of drugs are affected by genetic uh, variants of drug metabolizing enzymes. Poor or slow metabolizers, they lack the functional enzymes and are prone to increased toxicity due to slow drug metabolism. Therapeutic failure due to poor metabolism of pro-drug to its active form, for example, as we see in codeine. Uh, ultra rapid, on the contrary, increase the, there is increased enzyme activity, and this could cause therapeutic failure due to faster drug metab metabolism or increased toxicity due to faster conversion of parent drug to more active metabolite. In a multi-center audit conducted by uh, A. Wilcock uh, on potential for drug interactions involving cytochrome P450 in patients with uh, in patients attending palliative daycare settings, he uh, observed that of uh, 160 patients, 145, that is around 91%, were prescribed at least one drug that was either a substrate, inhibitor, or inducer of one of the five main CYP isoforms. 24 drug combinations involving 34 patients could have given rise to clinically important interactions. The drug in, uh, combinations observed in this study were grouped as clinically important and potentially important. These include uh, omeprazole and diazepam when given together was seen that uh, diazepam effect was increased. When phenytoin and dexamethasone was given together, the effect of dexamethasone was reduced. Potentially important drug combinations were when methadone was given with carbamazepine, it, it was observed that the effect of methadone was, uh, was significantly reduced. Pre uh, same was seen with prednisolone and diazepam. The effect of diazepam was reduced. When dexamethasone was given with amitriptyline and fentanyl, it was seen that the effect of amitriptyline and fentanyl was reduced as well. 
CYP3A4 is involved in metabolism of approximately 50% of the drugs. The study by Abdul Haddad explains the various factors that influence the drug interactions of CYP3A4. These include recipient drug concentrations, enzyme saturation relative to concentration of recipient drug at enzyme site, concentration of precipitant drug in liver versus plasma, precipitant drug interactions at both promoter site and structural enzyme site, drugs that is recipient and precipitant drug clearance through multiple organs or cytochromes, and contribution of P-glycoprotein to recipient and precipitant drug metabolism and elimination. So this uh, table here shows the various substrates, inhibitors, and uh, inducers of CYP3A4, of which clinically important and palliative care setting are when fentanyl given with dexamethasone interacts and uh, CYP3A4 mediated metabolism and thereby reduces its effect. The, uh, hence, uh, medications that are safe for alternatives are prescribed uh, as mentioned here. Macrolides such as erythromycin and clarithromycin has significant CYP3A4 interaction and therefore these are replaced by drugs such as azithromycin. Quinolone such as ciprofloxacin could be replaced by levofloxacin to avoid interactions. H2 blockers such as cimetidin uh, could be replaced by famotidin or ranitidin. HMG-CoA uh, HMG reductase inhibitors such as simvastatin, lovastatin, and atorvastatin have significant CYP3A4 interactions and therefore these are alternate, the alternatives used here would be fluvastatin and pra uh, pravastatin. Antidepressants such as fluoxetin and fluoxamine could be replaced by venlafaxine, citalopram, and metazapin. And antifungals such as fluconazole and nitroconazole could be replaced by drugs such as caspofungal. Another important metabolizing enzyme clinically significant in palliative setting is cytochrome CYP2D6, which is uh, described by uh, Mello P. Davis in his paper published in 2001. CYP2D6 plays an important role in the metabolism of uh, drugs such as codeine. Codeine is in the presence of CYP2D6 is converted into its active metabolite, that is morphine. Tramadol is converted into O dismethyl tramadol in the presence of CYP2D6. A poor metabolizer produces little or no analgesic effect, and on the other extreme, ultra-rapid metabolizers could produce life-threatening opioid toxicity. The above-mentioned study describes the following substrates and inhibitors of CYP2D6. So inhibitors of CYP2D6 could increase uh, the, uh, co uh, could reduce analgesic effect of codeine. Next, coming on to drug interactions affecting excretion. At the level of glomerular filtration, uh, changes in renal blood flow. Uh, drugs such as NSAIDs inhibit prostaglandins, thereby reducing the renal blood flow and therefore reduce the renal clearance of concomitant drugs. For example, lithium toxicity is seen when uh, prescribed with NSAIDs. Feed glycoprotein, tubular reabsorption. Manipulating urinary pH can alter the reabsorption of weak organic acids and bases. So weak acids in an alkaline medium becomes ionized and hence water soluble and therefore better excreted. Pharmacodynamic drug interactions. Pharmacodynamic uh, drug interactions occur when pharmacological effect of one drug is altered by that of another drug in a combination regime. The various uh, pharmacodynamic interactions include additivity, synergism, potentiation, and antagonism. Additivity is when two drug effects equal to the sum of the individual effects. This is seen in case of serotonin syndrome and drugs causing QT prolongation. Synergism occurs when com a, com a combined effect of two drugs is greater than the sum of these uh, effects when given separately. For example, synergistic sedation with medazolam and fentanyl, effect of codeine and aspirin. Potentiation occurs when one drug does not elicit a response on its own, but enhances the response to another drug. For example, alcohol potentiates the effect of diazepam. So the same is seen with hydroxyzine and morphine. Antagonism occurs when interacting drugs have opposing effects, for example, opiates with naloxone, warfarin, and vitamin K. First, let's look into serotonin syndrome. Serotonin syndrome is potentially a life-threatening condition associated with increased serotonergic activity in the central nervous system. It is seen with therapeutic medication use, inadvertent interactions between drugs, and intentional self-poisoning. 
William J. Scotton and his team elaborates the pathophysiology, clinical features, and management of serotonin syndrome, wherein they attribute the increased serotonergic activity due to increased synthesis from L-tryptophan, a step catal uh, catalyzed by tryptophan hydroxylase 2, increased presynaptic concentration of 5-hydroxytryptamine due to inhibition of serotonin metabolism by monoamine oxidase inhibitors, increased 5-hydroxytryptamine release by drugs such as amphetamine, cocaine and levodopa, inhibition of serotonin reuptake transporters such as SSRIs and TCAs, direct or indirect activation of postsynaptic 5-hydroxytryptamine A, direct or in, uh, direct uh, antagonism of postsynaptic 5-HT2A receptors. Drugs associated with uh, serotonin syndrome. The mechanisms involved are increased 5-HT synthesis by dietary supplements such as tryptophan, inhibition of 5-HT metabolism by monoamine oxidase inhibitors such as phenelzin and isocarboxacin, uh, increase, uh, increased release of 5-HT by psychotropic drugs such as cocaine, amphetamine and derivatives, cold remedies such as dextromorphin. Activation of 5-HT1 receptors by drugs such as uh, DNRIs, such as buspirone, opiates such as fentanyl and meperidin, antidepressants or mood stabilizers such as mirtazapine and lithium. Antagonism at 5-HT2A uh, receptors by second-generation antipsychotics such as quetiapine, clozapine, and olanzapine. Inhibition of 5-HT uptake from synaptic left by SSRIs such as fluoxetine, fluoxamine, and paroxetine. SNRIs such as venlafaxine, duloxetine, and desvenlafaxine, TCAs such as amitriptyline, desimipramine, nortriptyline, DNRIs such as buspirone, opioids such as levo, uh, levomethorphan, mepiridin, and met, uh, methadone, 5-HT3 receptor antagonists such as ondansetone and granisterone. Uh, th these are a spectrum of clinical features uh, that are described here. Clinical features associated with serotonergic drugs could be grouped under neuromuscular, autonomic, and cognitive disorders. Uh, the common side effects in, uh, associated with serotonergic drugs include brisk reflexes, diarrhea, and nausea, and insomnia. With mild, serotonin, uh, with mild serotonin uh, toxicity, we see hyperreflexia, inducible clonus, tachycardia, hypertension, and anxiety. With moderate serotonin toxicity, we see sustained clonus, opsoclonus, myoclonus, and tremors, hypothermia, however, temperature less than 38.5 degrees Celsius, midriasis, diaphoresis, flushing, and agitation. With severe serotonin toxicity, the features include respiratory failure, rigidity, severe hypothermia, more than 38.5 degrees Celsius, low GCS, and confusion. Hunter serotonin toxicity criteria. Uh, for serotonin syndrome to be diagnosed, these are the uh, clinical features that are associated. Presence of serotonergic agent, such uh, pre presence of serotonergic agent, maybe a recent addition, increased dose or overdose or interaction with one of the following conditions, such as spontaneous clonus or inducible clonus with agitation or diaphoresis, ocular clonus with agitation or diaphoresis, Ocular clonus or inducible clonus with hypertonia and temperature more than 38, point, uh, 38 degrees Celsius. Tremors and hyperreflexia together is, uh, uh, when present together is diagnostic of serotonin syndrome. The differential diagnosis for serotonin syndrome are uh, neuroleptic uh, malignant syndrome, anticholin anticholinergic uh, toxicity, and malignant hypothermia. While serotonin syndrome is due to serotonergic drugs, neuroleptic malignant syndrome is due to dopamine antagonist and dopamine withdrawal. Serotonin syndrome has a sudden onset within 24 hours and they resolve within 24 hours of treatment. While neuroleptic malignant syndrome, there is lower onset within days to weeks and it takes up to 20, 10 days to resolve with treatment. Though serotonin syndrome and neuroleptic malignant syndrome both present with hypothermia of a temperature more than 41 degrees Celsius, tachycardia, hypertension, and tachypnea, the, uh, they both present with delirium, agitation, and coma. The uh, uh, differentiating feature between serotonin syndrome and neuroleptic malignant syndrome is with the neuromuscular activity. Serotonin syndrome has a high, uh, hyperactive neuromuscular features such as tremors, myoclonus, hyperreflexia, and clonus. 
With neuroleptic malignant syndrome, we see lead pipe rigidity and bradykinesia with hypoactive bowel sounds. Anticholinergic toxicity seen with anticholinergic agents has a sudden onset of less than 24 hours and it resolves within hours to days with treatment. Uh, the characteristic feature here is hypothermia, tachycardia and uh, hypertension with midriasis. Mental state here is hypervigilance, agitation, hallucination, delirium with mumbling speech and coma. The muscle tone here is normal with, and with normal reflexes, dry flushed skin and mucous membrane hypoactive bowel sounds, urinary retention, and hyperkinesis. Malignant hypothermia is due to inhalational anesthetics and depolarizing muscle relaxants. The onset is here a very sudden within minutes to hours, however, it results within 24 to 48 hours with treatment. The characteristic feature here is rigomatous like rigidity, hyporeflexia, hypoactive bowel sounds, and rising in tidal carbon dioxide, mortal skin with flushing and cyanosis. The treatment, in, uh, the treatment with serotonin syndrome would mainly be to, would mainly be to continue, uh, discontinue the serotonergic agents, sedation with benzodiazepines. The drug of choice here would be lorazepam, one to two NG IV per dose, provide oxygen support, IV fluids, continuous cardiac monitoring, anticipate complications. If benzodiazepines and supportive care fail to improve, agitation and abnormal vitals, consider ciproheptadine, 12 milligram per oral. If temperature of more than 41.1 degrees Celsius, uh, immediate sedation, paralysis, and endotracheal intubation should be done, and antipyretics such as acetaminophen should be given. Uh, next is QT prolongation. Uh, QT, uh, corrected QT interval of more than 460 milliseconds in males and more than 470 in females is considered to be prolonged. Polymorphic VT is defined as ventricular rhythm faster than 100 beats per minute in adults with frequent variations of QRS axis, morphology, or both. Torsadis d pointers is a form of polymorphic VT that classically occurs in the setting of acquired or congenital QT interval prolongation and typically has a rate between 160 and 250 beats per minute. So a prolonged QT interval, ventricular rate of 160 to 250 per minute, irregular RR interval, and cycling of QRS axis through 180 degrees every 5 to 20 beats is characteristic of torsitis D pointers. Measuring the QT interval and calculating the corrected QT interval. Measure the QT interval together with the preceding RR interval in three to five uh, heartbeats from leads two, uh, from leads two and leads five, V5 or V6. Calculate the mean QT and RR interval from these three, uh, three to five measurements. So QT interval uh, is measured uh, from the onset of Q wave to the intersection of T wave maximum slope with the isoelectric line. The two formulas that are used for the uh, calculation of corrected QT interval are Bezet's formula and uh, Friedrich's formula. Uh, though Bezet's formula is more commonly used, it is uh, Friedrich's formula that is more accurate. Uh, this slide explains the mechanism of uh, QT prolongation. The cell membrane has uh, the HERG uh, potassium channels, that is, human ether ego related gene potassium channels that produce repolarizing current, termed the delayed rectifier current, resulting in longer action potential and therefore delayed QT interval. Uh, this uh, EG uh, shows uh, the no uh, QT interval uh, being prolonged. In men, it is more than 450 milliseconds, and in women, it is more than 470 milliseconds. Uh, the second image here shows the torsadis d pointers. Torsadis d pointers is basically polymorphic VT with QT prolongation. There is a short pre initiating RR interval due to in ventricular couplet, which is followed by a long initiating cycle resulting from compensatory pause after the couplet. These are the various uh, studies that show the incidence of uh, uh, QT prolongation and torsadis pointers Of over 41,649 uh, hospital admissions over six months, 0.7% of patients had a QT interval of more than 500 milliseconds. Of these, less than 6% had severe QT prolongation, syncope, or life-threatening arrhythmia. In a separate study of patients in a tertiary care hospital, 
hospital, the risk of torsitis de pointers ranged from 0.1 to 0.3 percent per year. 46 percent of these cases were from drug induced uh, drug induced torsitis de pointers. One third of the people who had experienced a drug overdose as a cause of sudden cardiac death were taking acutely prolonging medication. Looking into the risk factors for uh, QT prolongation, demographic features such as female sex are prone to QT prolongation due to lower repolarization reserve, higher risk of uh, torsitis de pointers with drugs that even mildly block the uh, rectifier current uh, potassium channels. Estrogen potentiates, brad uh, it, uh, it potentiates uh, bradycardia and uh, induced QT prolongation and arrhythmia. Advanced age. Underlying pathogenic variant uh, LQT, uh, LQTS gene, long QT syndrome gene is clinically inapparent until the patient is exposed to a particular drug or other predisposing factors such as hypokalemia or hypomagnesemia. Structural heart disease. In persons with structural heart disease such as the heart failure, diastolic dysfunction, myocardial ischemia, and left ventricular hypertrophy, Antiarrhythmic drugs and diuretic induced hypokalemia and or hypomagnesemia may contribute to proarrhythmia. Specific drug regimens, rapid infusion, high drug doses or concentration, uses of uh, use of medications that inhibit hepatic cytochrome P450 isoenzymes, concurrent use of drugs that slow the metabolism of QT prolonging drugs. CYP3A4 inhibitors such as erythromycin, they not only directly cause some um, QT prolongation, but also slows the metabolism of QT prolonging drugs, diuretics, and medications to treat COVID-19. Hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine alone or in combination with azithromycin for concomitant pneumonia has a compounding effect on inward rectifier potassium channels and thereby prolong QT interval and thereby cause autosatis D pointers. ECG abnormalities such as baseline QT prolongation Baseline T wave uh, uh, lability, the de uh, development of specific ECG changes during drug therapy, and bradycardia. Metabolic fact uh, factors such as hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, hypocalcemia, and acidosis also contribute to QT prolongation. The drugs that can cause the prolongation of QT are the antiarrhythmics, anti uh, such as class 1A agents such as quinidine, procainamide, and disopyramide. Class 3 agents such as sotalol, dofetilide, amiodarone, antimicrobials, fluoroquinolone such as ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, and moxifloxacin, macrolides such as erythromycin and azithromycin, antifungals such as fluconazole and ketoconazole, conventional antipsychotics such as the haloperidol and chlorpromazine, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors such as citalopram and acetalopram, and other drugs such as ronepezil, methadone, and ondansetron. Palliative medications with possible risk of torsitis de pointers include analgesics such as tramadol, buprenorphine, and hydrocodone uh, extended release, and uh, atypical antipsychotics such as aripiprazole, clozapine, and primavanserin. Prima, uh, prima Select antidepressants such as tricyclic antidepressants, mirtazapine, and venlafaxin, and antiemetics such as promethazine and palonocetron. The precautions that we have to take when using QT prolonging drugs include a baseline ECG should be obtained prior to the administration of drug. ECG should also be obtained during the course of treatment to detect prolongation of QT interval. The 2011 AHA scientific statement on prevention of torsitis de pointers suggests a strategy of documenting the QT interval before and at least every 8 to 12 hours after initiation, increasing the dose or overdose of QT prolonging drugs. Patients should be instructed to report promptly any new symptoms, including palpitations, syncope, or near syncope. They should also report clinical changes that could lead to hypokalemia, such as gastroenteritis or initiation of diuretic therapy. Treatment of torsitis de pointers with magnesium sulfate was described by Zoani, uh, Dan Zoani in his paper, and the drug of choice here would be magnesium sulfate. Uh, in adults, we can go up to 2 grams. Uh, given as IV infusion over 10 to 15 minutes. We measure the plasma magnesium after administration. Repeated doses may be needed. Isoproteranol in adults 0.5 to 5 mil, a microgram per minute and in children 0.1 to 1 milli, uh, microgram per kg per minute. It is given as continuous IV infusion 
An initial bolus dose of 20 to 60 microgram may be used in adults. We titrate the infusion rate to heart rate of 90 to 110. Heart rate, uh, higher heart rates may be uh, used if torsadus re uh, reoccurs. Next is drug-induced movement disorders. The mechanism involved here would be blockade of uh, D2 receptors and striatum, dopamine acetylcholine balance theory. Dopamine re uh, receptor blockers cause a, a decreased dopamine relative to acetylcholine. Treatment with anticholinergics improve the symptoms here. Dopamine supersensitivity hypothesis in tardive dyskinesia. Chronic dopamine blockade in striatum could lead to hyperkinetic moments. Symptoms exacerbate with withdrawal of antipsychotics. Symptoms improve with increased dosage. The various drug-induced movement disorders are extrapyramidal reactions. In, uh, when onset is within weeks, we uh, have acute akathisia, dystonia, and Parkinsonism. Tardive akathisia, dyskinesia, and dystonia occurs when the drug is used for more, uh, for, uh, more uh, a prolonged duration. Disorders with concurrent non-motor symptoms such as acute dopamine depletion, serotonin toxicity, antidepressant withdrawal syndrome, cerebellar ataxia, and postural or essential tremors. DSM-5 criteria for drug-induced movement disorders include neuroleptic-induced Parkinsonism, other medications-induced Parkinsonism, medication-induced acute dystonia, medication-induced acute akathisia, tardive dyskinesia, tardive dystonia, tardive akathisia, and medication-induced postural tremors. The drugs causing movement disorders include uh, uh, acute extrapyramidal reactions such as Parkinsonism, is uh, acute dystonia and acute akathisia seen with dopamine modulators uh, such as antipsychotics, metoclopramide, and levodopa, serotonin modulators such as selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, 5-HT3 antagonists, and 5-hydroxytryptophan, antiepileptics such as carbamazepine and valproate, and other drugs include deltiazem and lithium. Tardive or delayed onset extrapyramidal reactions are seen with dopamine modulators such as long term antipsychotics, metoclopramide, and typical antipsychotics. Drug induced cerebellar ataxia is seen with antiepileptics such as phenytoin and valproate, benzodiazepines such as cetirabin, uh, iron, uh, cetirabins and ironotican, uh, the cytotoxics that are involved with uh, drug induced cerebellar ataxia. Immunosuppressants and other drugs include lithium and metoclopramide. Drug induced postural tremors are seen with antiepileptics, antidepressants, antipsychotics, bronchodilators, and psychostimulants. Drug induced Parkinsonism 40% of patients treated with long term antipsychotics are, known to, are prone to drug induced Parkinsonism, most commonly seen in individuals over 60 years of age. It develops more than two weeks after starting the treatment. The tremors, uh, here, the characteristic features of the tremors are frequency of less than eight, it worsens at night, suppressed during voluntary moments, associated with rigidity and bradykinesia. It is differentiated from drug-induced tremors of hands, head, mouth, or tongue, which have frequency of eight to 12 cycles per second, best observed with hands held outstretched or mouth held open. The treatment here would be to stop the causative drug and uh, uh, adding benz, uh, benzotropin, 1 to 2 mg IV or IM, followed by 2 mg per oral OD or BD. Procyclidin, 5 to 10 mg IV or IM, followed by 2.5 mg or uh, 2.5 to 5 mg per oral or TDS, or uh, orphanadrine, 50 mg per oral BD or TDS. How to approach a patient with drug-induced Parkinsonism? When there is a suspected case of drug-induced Parkinsonism, we see if the drug could be stopped. If yes, then uh, does the Parkinsonism resolve within six months of follow-up? If yes, then uh, it is confirmed of drug-induced Parkinsonism. Here, we avoid antipsychotic drugs and other potential culprits in the future. If symptoms reoccur in the absence of culprit, culprit drugs, we evaluate for Parkinson's disease and other causes of neurodegenerative Parkinsonism. If Parkinson's uh, does not resolve within six months of follow-up, then we obtain a dopamine uptake scan if available. If, uh, it is, uh, if the dopamine uptake scan comes positive, that is reduced triatal uptake of dopamine, then uh, it is probable Parkinson's disease or other neurodegenerative cause of Parkinsonism. If, it, uh, if there is a negative dopamine uh, up, uh, if there is a negative dopamine uptake scan that is normal striatal uptake, then that could be a probable drug-induced Parkinsonism. 
Here, we decrease the dose of the causative drug or change to a drug with lower risk if possible. Consider symptomatic therapies for drug-induced Parkinsonism if the causative uh, drug cannot be lowered or changed. Avoid additional dopamine blocking agents. If a dopamine uptake scan is unavailable, the diagnosis is unclear. If possible, we reduce the dose of the causative drug or change to a drug with lower risk. If this is not possible, consider for symptomatic therapies for drug-induced Parkinsonism. Acute dystonia. This is seen with 10% of patients on antipsychotics, most commonly seen in young adults, and it develops within days of treatment associated with anxiety. The treatment here would be to discontinue the causative agent, benzotropin 1 to 2 mg IV or IM, procyclidin 5 to 10 mg IV or IM, diazepam 5 mg IV, diphenhydramine 20 to 50 mg IV or IM. If no benefit, we repeat it after 30 minutes and continue the treatment per oral for one week with orphanadrine 50 mg twice daily or thrice daily or diphenhydramine 20 to 50 mg twice daily or four, uh, six daily. Acute akathisia, motor restlessness, pacing up and down, frequent change in body uh, position is seen here. This is seen with 20% of patients on antipsychotics. The age group involved here are 15 to 60 years of age, particularly middle-aged women. It develops within days of starting, resolving uh, results within weeks of stopping the drug. Highest risk is seen with haloperidol and prochlorperazin. Increased risk is seen with concurrent use of morphine or valproate. The treatment here would basically be to, the dis uh, to discontinue the drug, switch to atypical antipsychotics, propranolol 10 mg uh, thrice daily, increase every few days, maximum dose here could be 120 mg per day. In case of severe dis uh, distress, benzodiazepine such as diazepam 5 to 10 mg per day or clonazepam 0.5 to 1 mg per day or lorazepam 1 to 3 mg per day could also be given. When it is haloperidol induced, uh, anti-Parkinsonian drugs may also benefit here. Tardive dyskinesia, long-term administration of D-receptor blockers. 20% of patients on antipsychotics for more than three months are prone to tardive dyskinesia. It is more common in females, elderly on high doses of antipsychotics. Early diagnosis would be with features such as worm-like movements of tongue on protrusion, inability to protrude tongue for more than few seconds. The treatment here, uh, they respond very poorly to drugs. Anti-Parkinsonian drugs increase the symptoms. Withdrawal of causal agents, uh, recovery is seen within three months in 30% of patients, five years in 40%, and sometimes even irreversible. Tetrabenazine, 12.5 uh, to 25 mg thrice daily. Reserpin, levodopa, initial deterioration, but long-term benefit is seen here. Baclofen, clonazepam, diazepam, or valprovate, shows inconsistent results. This is a table that broadly differentiates the various movement disorders, uh, tardive dyskinesia, dystonia, akathisia, Parkinsonism, and neuroleptic malignant syndrome. The time of onset with uh, tardive dyskinesia is uh, weeks to years, whereas in dystonia, it may be hours to days in acute variant, and in tardive, it is weeks to years. Akathisia, again, it may be days to months in acute, <coughs> weeks to years in tar uh, tardive, and uh, Parkinsonism, uh, the onset is within days or weeks to even years. And neuroleptic malignant syndrome, it is hours to weeks. The moment, uh, moment phenomenon, uh, phenomenon with tardive dyskinesia is choreoathetotic, athetotic and stereotypic movements. With dystonia, you see pulling, twisting, and sustained and repetitive movements. Akathisia, there is inner feeling of restlessness with urge to move and inability to maintain seated. In Parkinsonism, you see tremors and or bradykinesia. Whereas in neuroleptic malignant syndrome, there is generalized lead pipe rigidity. Other clinical features with tardive dyskinesia are difficulty in speaking, eating, or ambulating. With dystonia, there is muscle pain or cramps. With Parkinsonism, there is soft speech, dysphagia, and fatigue. And with neuroleptic malignant syndrome, there is hypothermia, altered consciousness, and autonomic symptoms. Uh, the last topic here under uh, our drug interactions would be synergistic sedation. Uh, synergistic sedation, I'll be explaining it with the case uh, given in this paper by Michael P. Hutchins. Uh, they looked at a case of a 50-year-old man with history of schizophrenia who was stably maintained on clozapine, 300 mg thrice daily, and sertraline, 100 mg six daily. He developed hemoptysis and underwent lung dissection 
for squamous cell carcinoma of his left lung. He was anxious in the holding area and received midazolam to NG IV. An epidural was placed and anesthesia was induced. Intraoperatively, patient was persistently and severely hypotensive and required repeated boluses of phenylephrine and, uh, and phenylephrine infusion despite minimal blood loss. Over the last 2.5 hours of procedure, 250 microgram of fentanyl was given via epidural catheter to augment the post-operative analgesia. An epidural infusion of 0.1% bupivacaine with hydromorphone 10 microgram per ml was started in post-anesthesia care unit. Because he could not be weaned from phenylephrine infusion in post op period, the ICU team decided to reduce his epidural infusion. Interestingly, although patient aroused to stimulus, he was also noted to be sleeping on all nursing assessments. When the patient finally woke and drowsily complained of pain, he was given a total, a total of two doses of oxycodone, 5 ng orally, over a 10 hour period. He subsequently exhibited mental status changes and respiratory depression. Reintubation was considered. However, he was ma uh, ultimately managed on BiPAP for several hours. Psychiatric consultation was called. They recommended reducing a close up dose to total of 500 NG per day and discontinuation of sertraline. By post-op day three, the patient had striking improvement in his mental status, was of, uh, of phenylephrine and was awake and appropriate. So these are, uh, these are the two types of interactions that we see here. The first interaction is pharmacodynamic, uh, that is synergic, synergistic CNS depression. Uh, the substrates here were clozapine, midazolam, fentanyl, hydromorphone, and oxycodone. The mechanism or site of action was synergistic CNS depression, and clinical effect was uh, sedation. The second type of interaction that we see, saw here was pharmacokinetic, with uh, involving the enzyme CYP2D6. The substrate here is clozapin, and sertralin, being an inhibitor of CYP2D6, delayed the metabolism of clozapin, thereby increasing the bioavailability of clozapin. Clozapin is an antipsychotic medication with strong CNS depressant effect. It carries a black box warning with respect to CNS sedation when co administered with benzodiazepines. Clozapin is a CYP2D6 substrate. The above, the above mentioned synergistic sedation is a potential drug effect that one must be watch, uh, that one must watch out for while prescri uh, prescribing uh, opioids. However, the same drug interaction principle is used in inducing palliative sedation and intentional administration of sedative drugs in dosages and combination required to reduce consciousness of treat a terminal patient as much as necessary to adequately relieve one or more refractory symptoms. Uh, the summary of my presentation here is we saw that uh, we saw different types of drug interactions. Some interactions can increase the beneficial effects such as uh, phenobarbitone and fentanyl and uh, palliative sedation. Some interactions increase the harmful effects such as drugs causing serotonin syndrome. In palliative care settings, commonly used analgesics are opioids and hence we should be mindful of their interactions. Thank you. So, uh, Naveen, can you take up the questions if there are any or any comments? Um, Dr. Kritika Rao is uh, moderating the session. So, Dr. Kritika, Kritika, can you summarize and then take up the questions? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Gayatri. That was a wonderful presentation where you explained very much in detail about uh, the pharmacodynamic and the pharmacokinetic interactions that we see in and very well in our practice where we see uh, so many patients who are not only uh, on medications prescribed by us, but they may also be having multiple other comorbidities for which various other medications are in use. And hence, uh, practical advice would be about trying to review their medication charts before we start uh, prescribing so that we are aware of various drug-drug interactions uh, and history about their various clinical uh, uh, past uh, history in terms of various comorbidities for which certain and certain medications are uh, restricted to use, where we need to keep in mind the dosages or the interactions that can occur. So very commonly where she talked about, you know, the pharmacogenomics, which is very important that is coming up in the field of precision medicine. 
where we uh, keep in mind uh, each patient's, uh, uh, when we make a rational choice in our prescription so that we avoid various drug-drug interactions. And um, it helps in terms of uh, keeping uh, a regular check in our prescription on every visit so that these life-threatening complications like QT prolongation or serotonin syndrome are easily identified and we are able to, uh, you know, uh, you know, pick it up early so that patients do not have to suffer with this. So um, I would open this forum for more questions so that we can discuss on it. Any questions and comments from anyone? It was an important topic which he has explained it, uh, that he has explained it very well. Naveen, who would like to comment or any senior or junior person? Uh, Madam, as I told, a uh, lot of this uh, questions uh, which probably people can have has already been uh, covered in the topic which Dr. Gayatri has presented. But if there are any specific questions in the chat box, we will talk. Yeah. Anyone wants to add anything? Ma'am, Anuja here. Yes, please, Anuja. Go ahead. Thank you, Gayatri. Thank you, uh, Kritika, for summarizing the presentation. It was uh, very detailed indeed. Uh, just uh, one more uh, addition to this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, the drug interactions, uh, what we see in palliative care practice, it's very common and often missed. And we, uh, as Gayatri has uh, shown us uh, various articles as well as various uh, groups of drugs that cause interactions. One more important thing is to remember the dose-dependent drug interaction as well. Uh, yeah. So uh, I think uh, that is uh, important because uh, we tend to see the drug, uh, but then if the dosage that we use often of drugs are not very high dose or, uh, uh, you know, very... Uh, so dose-dependent drug interactions can be uh, also seen and it can be avoided. So not necessarily that, uh, you know, we should just see the drugs. We should see what at what dose and at what level will these drugs will cause drug interactions. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely, Anuja. Thank you. Any other comment? I just want to... Dr. Spenley, yes, yeah. please. Uh, it's, it's a very difficult lecture, difficult topic, but very nicely uh, explained. And I think uh, we should keep these things in mind in our regular practice. And I think some charts, you know, some regular detailed charts, which would be there under our desk, you know, under the thing so that we could easily refer, you know, because otherwise it's difficult to put all this kind of information into practice. So uh, like a ready reckoner, it should be there available for us under our desk, you know, so that we could use them effectively. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Stanley, for uh, for suggestion. I think what we will do, uh, maybe Kritika, if you can make uh, some kind of a commonly used drugs in palliative medicine, and uh, these are the I think it's available everywhere. But I, if you can prepare a chart for, and we can we can put on the IAPC website that commonly used drug from uh, article from Dr. Brewer. I think it it explains everything, but. Uh, just for ready made so people can print, take the print out and just uh, put their on their wall of the their walls of wherever they are working. Oh, sure, sure, madam. Uh, so we can we can pre publish it in the I on the IEPC website or next newsletter based on this requirement. Okay. There is one question from uh, Pankaj: Are neuroleptic syndrome or serotonergic syndrome dose dependent? Prashita, would you like to answer? Uh, yes, I would definitely want to answer that in terms of it is dose dependent, 
so there are certain interactions between certain drugs wherein when we go on to uh, especially when we use opioids with other ser uh, serum inducers or or uh, the cytochrome p50 substrate uh, inducers or inhibitors together there has been seen that it has been more dose dependent rather than directly at a smaller dose and that's why serially when we are prescribing having a, a assessment done at every visit would be more important Thank you, Kritika. So I can't see any other questions and uh, I will wait for one more second if somebody wants to give any comment. Otherwise, yes, please. So. We will stop here then. Uh, I think this, is, this was a, such an important topic. And you know, it is important for all of us to understand and to remember or to practice every day that what are the commonly used drugs in palliative medicine and what are the various because most of the time when patient will come for palliative, in palliative medicine they will they must be taking medications already for any other for so many comorbidities by the time they are there so it is important that we should be having a fair idea that which drug has an interaction and uh, which drug should be cautiously used and what are the various uh, side effects of uh, interaction of those drugs if at all it is important and how you should manage and Gayatri has given such an excellent overview uh, although uh, it is important because there were so many new inform information she has given and I, I, I acknowledge that it will not be possible to remember right now everything but this is an important topic and as suggested by Dr. Stanley, Kritika will make a good uh, summary of the lecture with uh, Gayatri and we will publish it on IAPC website so that people will remember, like especially for with the methadone, morphine and fentanyl and uh, any uh, uh, like simple anti I think this drug interaction, definitely people must be knowing so that they will not uh, do some uh, something wrong with the patient, it's like uh, something which is not in favor of the patient. Thank you, Kritika. I know that Gayatri is a first year MD student and uh, this shows that uh, KMC Manipal is doing so well that she has prepared this lecture so well. Uh, first year PG, uh, I think it is. It, it was a tough topic for her, but she has prepared it so well and she has not left any anything. So this shows that uh, you all as a team working very hard and especially Kritika, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, ma'am. So we will see you next week, next week, Monday, before 6.30. Please join before 6.30 because we will not wait for you. And if you will miss the initial two, three slides, you will not be able to understand and you will not be able to concentrate. So thank you, Arjuna and Nisha. Uh, we'll see you all at, uh, next week, Monday, before 6.30. Have a good week. Thank you.